Now we've seen what a VP looks like. We can start thinking about what the structure of a whole clause might be. So if all phrases are projected from a head, what projects the whole clause? What projects a sentence? And one very reasonable way to think about this would be to say that actually the head of the sentence is the verb. So that would mean that that label we've been giving it S, uh, we should replace with VP. So this is saying that what we've been thinking of as sentences are really VPs. Notice that means that what we've been thinking of as VPs would now be the smaller projections. Those would be V bars. And that is a very reasonable hypothesis, and it looks like it would allow us to account for at least simple sentences. So, um, Donald forgot Pauline's name. But we may run into some problems when we look at slightly more complex sentences. So if we look at sentences which include, for example, a modal or another auxiliary, so have or be, we need more structure to accommodate those. So where do those appear? Again, we could hypothesize about those that since modals and auxiliaries seem to be types of verbs, so in English, for example, they carry the same kind of tense in, uh, information that verbs do, so they seem to have verbal properties, we could say these are kinds of verbs and that we have a kind of recursion here. That is to say, what you'd want to say about auxiliaries and about modals is just that they are verbal heads, they project then VPs, and they take a complement. What's, what introduces the recursion here is that they're a complement is also a VP. And again, that's a pretty reasonable analysis for sentences. However, there is a different way to think about this. Not very different, but slightly different. Um, and one thing to notice is that modals and auxiliaries also have different properties to other verbs. Um, we see this particularly with modals. So one property that's different from other verbs is that modals only have finite forms. We don't find infinitive forms of modals, so you can't say it would be nice to can swim, although that seems a perfectly sensible thing to want to be able to say. We have to express it differently. We can't use, uh, there is no infinitive form of can. Um, similarly, there's no past participle form of can or will. So modals can't occur in non-finite forms. And in fact, this is one, uh, one reason why thinking of this in terms of recursion looks a little bit odd, because modals require that the verb that follows them be non-finite. So you say things like, he may be ready. If modals themselves can't be non-finite, then in fact, you can't get sequences of modals. A modal can't take another phrase headed by a modal as its complement. And this is true in standard varieties of English. So it seems that actually the structure isn't really recursive. So we can instead focus on some of the things that are different about modals in particular and hypothesize that they actually belong to a different category. It's a category that's associated with verbs, but it's a distinct category. So it's a closed class category, a category that has a very small number of different members. What has also come to be called in syntax a functional category, and we'll be seeing more of these functional categories as we proceed. So the category that people associate with modals is the category of inflection or infill, or I. And inflection here covers agreement. It also covers tense. An alternative category that sometimes people propose for modals is in fact to say they belong to category T for tense. For now, we're going to stick to the hypothesis that it's I, but the distinction is not that important for us at the moment. So let's say that modals are of category I for inflection. So following X bar schema, they're going to project an I bar, and IP. So now, instead of saying that the modal is a verb, which takes another verb phrase as its complement, 
we would simply have the same kind of structure, except that we would say the modal is an I category, it projects an I bar, and that I takes a VP as its complement. So that now, a sentence, rather than being a VP, is an IP, and it contains a VP, the VP that's the complement of the modal. This will actually allow us to explain another difference between the behavior, the syntactic behavior, rather than morphological, of modals as opposed to verbs, as opposed to main verbs. And that is the position, the relative position, of modals, main verbs, and negation for one, and also certain adverbs for another. So modals always precede sentential negation. So you get, so you get examples like Iris will paint the door, Iris will not paint the door. Main verbs in English, on the other hand, can't occur before negation. So in modern English, you can't say, Iris paints not the door. You find a similar pattern with adverbs. So adverbs have a lot more freedom in where they occur than negation does. So adverbs sometimes occur at the beginning of sentences. So you'll get things like, quickly, Arthur opened the tin or they can occur at the very end, so Arthur opened the tin quickly. But many adverbs can also occur in the middle of the sentence, in which case we call them sentence medial adverbs. And if we look at the ones when they're occurring in the middle of sentences, we notice that modals can immediately precede adverbs when these adverbs are in the middle. So you'll get things like, Arthur may quickly open the tin. What you don't get is where the main verb immediately precedes the adverb, in which case the adverb would separate the verb from a, the direct object. So what is ungrammatical is something like, Arthur opened quickly the tin. So again, that's a difference in the relative order of a verb with respect to something in the middle of the sentence, an adverb or a negation and the order that a modal takes with respect to those elements. And now we actually have a way that we could explain that or at least describe it in a systematic way. So focusing for the moment just on negation, the generalization would be that negation can follow immediately modals but has to precede main verbs. So what we could say is that negation is itself a head. Again, it would be a functional category. So we could say there's a functional category of negation. Following the X-bar schema, that's going to project uh, a phrase. So we'll have neg and neg p. And if we say that that phrase takes the VP as its complement, but doesn't take IP as its complement, that will have the effect that negation will occur immediately to the left of the main verb what will never occur to the left of a modal. So now all we need to do is to make certain that modals can take either neg phrases as their complements or VPs as their complements, and that will give us those orders correctly. But we now have a problem if we think about how we got to this final structure. If we set aside negation for the moment and just think about what the elementary trees would have to be like for the modal and for the main verb to produce the sentence we've just seen, we'll wind up with these two elementary trees where, so the subject is going to appear in the elementary tree for the modal and the object is going to appear in the elementary tree for the verb. But that can't be right, because the subject is not an argument of the modal. The subject is an argument of the verb. It gets its participant role from the verb, just like the object does. And also, in fact, semantically, modals take scope over the entire proposition. So a sentence like, Donald may forget Pauline, means something like, it's possible that Donald forgets Pauline, not 
Donald and then some possibility about something. So the scope of the modal should include the subject and all of the rest, that whole proposition. So that leads us to suggest that those elementary trees can't be right. They really don't reflect the selectional properties of those heads, which is what elementary trees do. That's what they represent. Instead, we really want to show that the modal isn't selecting that subject, so the subject doesn't appear in the elementary tree for the modal. It does appear in the elementary tree for the verb, just as we've already seen when we've been looking at elementary trees for verbs. But of course, the problem with these trees is if we assemble them by the process of substitution that we've already seen, so we put these trees together and we put in the arguments, of course, the problem we have now is we have the wrong order for a declarative sentence. The subject is appearing at the left edge of the verb phrase, not in front of the inflectional node, not in front of the modal. It's also worth noting that I focused here on the selectional properties of the items and stressed that the subject is an argument, is selected by the verbal head. It is also true, however, that the subject is entering into some kind of relation with the modal. It's not a thematic relation. It's not getting a thematic role from the modal. But it is entering into a kind of grammatical relation. You actually can't see this with modals in English, but you see it if you use another auxiliary. So if we switch now to have and be, what you see is there's a relation of agreement between the subject and the auxiliary. So you get the children are playing, not the children is playing, even though the children is an argument of the verb play. So the phenomenon that we're seeing here is that that subject argument seems to be participating in two different relations, in relation of agreement with, the, um, with what we're calling the inflectional node, and in a relation of selection with the verb. And not only that, but one of those relations looks as though it would require that subject to be in a different position. The, what is selected by the verb should be within the projection of the verb. So this kind of situation, and we're going to see other examples of this kind of situation, forces to propose another kind of operation in our syntax. And that operation could be called movement, or it's sometimes also called copying. The idea is that once a phrase has been substituted into the structure in the position where it's selected, so in the case of the subject of a verb, that would be the subject position inside that VP, because it's an argument of the verb, after that operation has taken place, it's part of the structure, it can subsequently move to a different position in the structure. It can move up in the structure to satisfy another relation at a different position in the structure. So in this case, the subject would be substituted in as the subject of the VP. It would satisfy the selectional requirements that the verb requires to have a an agent argument, and then it would move to the specified position of the IP, a position in which it agrees with the inflectional node. So now we've introduced another way of building structure. We had substitution, and now we've added this operation of movement. Now, there are different ways to theorize this relation of movement. In particular, there's different ways to think about what is left behind when the phrase moves to the higher position. One way to think about this is to hypothesize that what happens is that the element that moves is actually a copy, so that you copy the nominal phrase in this case, and it's the copy that appears in the higher position. And if this was to happen again, you'd wind up with a chain of copies of the same phrase. Clearly, what you'd need in addition, or as part of this process of copying, is you would need a process that would guarantee that only 
one element in that chain of copies is pronounced, the highest element. An alternative way of describing this is to say that what gets left behind by movement is a special type of category. It's similar in all respects to what's moved, but it is inherently unpronounced. And this special type of category is called a trace. It's often given a subscript matching a subscript on the moved element, so it, it can be clear what element it is that moved and left that trace. These two proposals for how to think about what gets left behind in movement, whether it's a copy or a special trace category, can actually be distinguished in their empirical predictions. So they're not entirely equivalent, but for many purposes they are equivalent and here we're not going to go into what the differences might be down the line of choosing one variety over another. So we're not going to make a distinction between these two ways of theorizing this. The crucial point here is this idea that a phrase can be moved from the position in which it's substituted into the structure to a position higher in the tree. There are various kinds of data that people have observed or discovered um, in looking at this question of the structure of the clause, and in particular at this hypothesis that we've now been examining, namely that the subject of the clause, what you see in the specifier of the IP, originates in the specifier of the VP. That hypothesis has been termed the VP internal subject hypothesis. That is that the subject of the sentence originates in a position internal to the VP. So just as a couple of pieces of, um, of evidence that relate to this. So one has to do with sentential idioms. So idioms come in various sizes, um, but there are a class of idioms where the subject is part of the idiom and the verb phrase is also part of the idiom. So it looks like maybe it's the whole sentence is idiomatic. So, you get, so examples of that would be things like um, heads will roll or the shit hit the fan. But actually, when you look more closely at those idioms, it seems it isn't exactly the whole sentence. The idiom seems to skip a bit in the middle. That is, the subject has to be, have exactly that form. The verb phrase have, has to have exactly that form. But you could have different modals and auxiliaries, and that doesn't disturb the idiom. It's still remained idiomatic, so if you say, Heads may roll, heads will roll, heads have rolled. It doesn't make any difference. The heads part is part of the idiom, the roll part is part of the idiom, but it seems to skip the bit in the middle. But now, now that we've seen that the way to think about subjects is that they actually originate in an elementary tree together with the verb, this actually is really as expected. That is to say, these idioms, the chunk that is parceled together and memorized is actually the VP, which includes the subject now in this way that we're looking at it. So now it's unsurprising that there should be idioms where the modal is free, but the subject and the rest of the sentence form the idiom. There's an argument from the way quantifiers behave, or rather the position in the sentence in which some quantifiers occur which seems to follow from the VP internal subject hypothesis. And this is an argument which was one of the original arguments supporting this idea, in fact. When you have a quantifier like all modifying the subject, it can occur in more than one place. So one common way to have it is it immediately precedes what looks like a DP, in which case it actually forms a constituent with that DP. So you can get a sentence like, all the workers may leave. And in this case, all the workers forms a constituent. So all the workers may leave, who may leave, all the workers, works fine. You can also get all following the subject. So you can get the workers all left. And in this case, it doesn't seem to form a constituent with the subject. So if you say the workers all left, who left? The workers all. That's ungrammatical. And what's perhaps even more surprising is that that quantifier doesn't even have to be next to the subject when it follows it. So if you have a modal, you can get something like 
the workers may all leave. So now the quantifier is occurring after the modal, whereas the subject is occurring before it. So one possible hypothesis here is that this happens because the quantifier and the, the noun phrase, such as the workers, they begin together, perhaps as a noun phrase inside another noun phrase. And then either the whole structure can move, in which case you'd get all the workers may leave, or the sub part, just the workers, may move on its own, in which case you get the workers may all leave. So that's, that's a case where the quantifier uh, is described as being stranded. So it looks like the quantifier has been left behind. Notice then that that gives us a kind of clue as to where the subject originally was, that is, after the modal, just before the verb. So an obvious question that's probably occurred to you already is how to deal with simple sentences. So now we've dealt with sentences with modals, and we've said that they're IPs, that the inflection mode uh, is projected from the modal, and that that creates then an IP, and that the verb phrase is the complement of the I. So sentences and modals are IPs. Would we want to say that sentences that don't have modals are some different category? And clearly we wouldn't, apart from anything else, Sentences that have modals and sentences that simply have finite verbs in them have exactly the same distribution. So you never find, uh, a con you never find an environment where something says, I want to have as my complement a uh, sentence that has to contain a modal, or I want to have as my complement a finite sentence, but it mustn't contain a modal. So it looks as though we want sentences containing modals and sentences just containing a finite verb to have the same category. So we want them all to be IPs. So what we'd say for a sentence which just contains, say, a past tense verb or a present tense verb is that tense itself is the inflectional element. This tense head is actually itself silent. It has an effect on the form of the verb in the VP. That's what seems to happen for English. So one way to think of this would be to say that if you think about how a modal occurs with a particular form of verb in the VP that it takes as a complement, so a modal selects for the bare infinitive form of the verb in its VP complement. So you could say that a past tense selects for a particular form of the verb that occurs in its VP complement, the past tense form, and a present tense selects for a particular form of the verb that appears in its VP complement, the present tense form. Exactly the relationship between tense and verbs seems to work differently in different languages, and this is something that we're going to come back to in a later class. For many clauses, and particular for root clauses, the structure that we've seen so far seems to be sufficient. But if we look now at embedded clauses, it seems that we're going to need a bit more structure because embedded clauses are often, not always in English, but often introduced by another element. So in a root clause, you might have something like, Betsy would never go to Peru. As an embedded clause, you can get, Ian thought Betsy would never go to Peru, or Ian thought that Betsy would never go to Peru. And in fact, in many languages, that optionality of the element corresponding to that isn't there. So in many languages, that something like the that that we're seeing sometimes in English is always present. There are other elements like that which introduce subordinate clauses. So that introduces subordinate declarative clauses. Subordinate interrogative clauses can be introduced by another element. So what correspond to yes, no questions are introduced as subordinate clauses by if. So she wondered if Betsy was going to Peru. So we've got these elements that and if, and there are other, there are other cases as well, which introduce these subordinate clauses. 
these elements do possibly two things. One is to say that what they're introducing is indeed a subordinate clause. The other, though, is to say what type of clause it is. So that is associated with declarative clauses, whereas if is associated with interrogative clauses. These elements that introduce subordinate clauses are, are called complementizers. This, you, can, you can think of this as being related to the fact that a subordinate clause is going to be the complement of the verb that introduces it. So a complementizer is another functional category. We've already seen a functional category of inflection. Now we've got a functional category complementizer, which is often abbreviated to C. So the that that you get in Thomas knew that Betsy would never go to Peru is an instance of a complementizer. So now we've introduced this new lexical item and it is going to have an associated elementary tree. So following the X-bar schema, we'll have an elementary tree rooted in a complementizer or a C category, and it's going to project a C bar and a CP. So that complementizer then will take as its complement the structure we've been so seeing so far, an IP. One case where the X bar schema doesn't seem to give us enough positions in, to accommodate all the phrases that we want is modification. So we've seen with modifiers that unlike complements and specifiers, you seem to be able to get a virtually unlimited number of modifiers. Both we've seen this for VP modifiers, we've seen it for modifiers inside noun phrases. So we don't want to include positions for modifiers inside our elementary trees for verbs, for example. We want the elementary tree for a verb to include the phrases that it selects, but not all the possible modifiers that it could occur with, for two reasons. One is because there's an almost unlimited number, so that would suggest that these items we're storing in our lexicon can be extremely large, which is not the way we think things are. And also, and this is a related fact, what we're putting in the lexicon is the items that are selected by the head, the phrases that are selected by the head. But modifiers don't seem to be selected by heads. So it's not a fact about a particular verb that you can modify its verb phrase by something which tells you about the time of the event or the reason for the event or the person for whom the event um, was done. So we don't want to have those in those elementary trees. But that means we need another way of getting those modifiers into the structure. So one crucial insight about modifiers is that when you add a modifier to a phrase, the result is a phrase of exactly the same type. Now that's quite different from what happens if you add a complement or if you add a specifier. And we've seen this, for example, with verbs. So we've seen that you can't replace a verb by do so. So, so you can't say, for example, John ate a banana and Gerald did so an apple. On the other hand, Adding a modifier doesn't affect whether you can replace something by do so or not. So you can say, John ate a banana and Geraldine did so too. And if you added another modifier, you would also be able to replace that with do so. So when you add a modifier to any category, the result is something of that same category. So this is now going to give us a recursive structure. So modifiers introduce recursion. That is to say, a modifier has a sister and a mother that are of the same category. So how are we going to achieve that in our trees? To do that, we're going to introduce a third operation. So we have substitution, we have movement, and now we're going to add a junction. So the way a junction works is this. You have some node, let's say a V-bar, and you want to adjoin uh, some phrase, so let's say in this case a PP, it could be an adverb phrase. So you take your V-bar and you create another V-bar above it. You create another node of exactly the same type. And now the modifier, the PP, is going to be added as a daughter of this new node and it is, becomes then a sister of the original node. And we call such an element then an adjunct. So this is an adjunct position. The modifier occupies an adjunct position. Now, because the mother that you added is the same category as the daughter, 
you could do this again. So you could add yet another modifier. You would take the V bar, you would create another V bar node, you would take your modifier, you would make it a daughter of the new node and become a sister of the old node. So you could do this an indefinite number of times and that's exactly what allows you to have a whole stack, a whole staircase of modifiers. In this case, I've illustrated it with a junction to V bar, but you can adjoin to other categories as well. And we've already seen a junction of modifiers inside noun phrases. So that process will work exactly the same way. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.